Hi everyone and welcome back to chapter 9 where we're going to focus on complaints and grievances. And in order to understand complaints and grievances as they are performed within an organization, we're going to have to talk about and define um, what a union is. So a union is a group who represents workers that are negotiating the best possible outcome for their wages, benefits, and conditions of employment. And if you've ever heard the phrase union run shop or union shop, um, what this means is in order to be a member of you know, to work in that industry or to work in that organization, you have to join the member or the union as a condition of your employment. Um, the police union is one of the most powerful unions in history and certainly in current existence. Um, so let's talk about the birth of all of this a little bit, and that happened through some legislation, starting with national the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 which legalized collective bargaining. And what is collective bargaining? Um, it's negotiation of wages and employment conditions. Um, it requires that employers negotiate with elected, elected representatives of the union who are speaking on behalf of all of their employees. This was followed by the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Um, law enforcement is covered by this. It mandates a 40-hour week. And any time over that 40 hours, there is mandatory um, increase in compensa compensation at time and a half, and it provides mandatory comp time for every hour of overtime work. So that comp time, for those of you who don't know, um, means for every hour you work, you get that hour back to take it as leave in the future. Um, with, this is followed by the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, and this act attempted to balance the power between the unions and management by disallowing management from blocking unfair labor practices, including closing the sh a closed shop. And a closed shop means that it prohibits management from hiring non-union workers. So the idea here being that management, you know, before the Taft-Hartley Act um, would try to, you know, just simply get rid of all the union workers by hiring non-union workers and then the problems are over, um, but this act stopped them from doing that. <clears throat> so why do people join the police union? Um, well, there's a lot of reasons, but it is um, the desire of most employees because they want their employable needs met. They want safe working conditions. They want thoroughly outlined and pre-established grievance procedures, and there's frequently wage disputes. So the union is pre is often management's biggest stressor, um, finding a happy meeting between their organizational goals that they have to achieve and, you know, through the negotiations that the union wants to achieve for their representatives. Um, so we talked about collective bargaining, and this is when union members um, who are representing all of the employees are going to meet with management, and they're going to negotiate a work contract out. Typically, uh, negotiations or contracts are three years long uh, before they meet again for more collective bargaining. And it will define the wages. It will define benefits. It'll define working hours, overtime, uh, grievance procedures, disciplinary procedures, etc. So the entire concept behind the union is to protect its workers and to provide better working conditions um, for the people that they represent. Sometimes unions get too powerful, right? This has been asserted um, that the conditions that are negotiated by police unions, especially regarding disciplinary procedures, that they just have too much leverage, they have too much to bargain, too much of a, a strong bargaining position. And therefore, when they go into the collective bargaining and they argue out what disciplinary procedures look like, um, it doesn't tend to be balanced. It tends to be heavily skewed in the direction of law enforcement's favor. So we see things like suspensions with pay, right? Or we see things like, um, you know, disciplinary procedures and outcomes that don't necessarily match the infraction. So that would be an example of where people argue that police unions are too powerful. <clears throat> Um, grievance, grievances are often uh, a heavy emphasis in the negotiating process, and the outcome of that is largely the idea of just cause, that management has to prove if they are going, um, to, they have to prove that that act in question was actually committed and that it violated a rule or a policy. Um, management must also show that discipline imposed is not arbitrary, capricious, unreasonable, or discriminatory. So they can't just punish willy-nilly, they can't just punish one person with one punishment and punish somebody else for the same infraction for a completely different punishment, there has to be some sort of consistent pre-established um, system that is followed. 
It's really important that management and unions work together. Remember, they're all part of the same organization and they're all trying to meet organizational goals, even though the two groups do have different interests, right? So administration has budgetary interests and they have public interests and they have, you know, the overall functioning of the organization, whereas the union representatives are looking for um, the increased wages and, and benefits of the actual line workers. The point here being that it can become very adversarial. It can become an us against them sort of argument. And everybody needs to remember that you're all part of the same organization with the same mission and the same goals. Um, given their importance and their utility, law enforcement organizations are not allowed to strike. So in other unions, so for example, teachers unions and so forth, um, if their collective bargaining needs are not met, they might say, okay, then we're not coming to work and we're not going to come back to work until you meet us halfway. Police is, um, policing is an area where you can't do that, right? It's, it's an absolutely necessary job. Police can't just all decide to take off one day or for one month or whatever and strike because you know the public safety is at stake so that is something that um that is a, a a fact of the negotiation process is you cannot use that tool in negotiation uh for law enforcement but it doesn't mean that it never happens so we have something called the blue flu and the blue flu is a completely unofficial um approach to collective bargaining ne negotiations where if the employees and the union representatives are not happy with what the administration is offering them, if they feel that the administration isn't offering them enough or working with them, um, well, everybody just suddenly gets the flu and doesn't come to work, right, all on the same day, which is a big problem for that organization because imagine no officers for, you know, two weeks but you still have the same rate of 911 calls coming in and car accidents and, and disputes and domestic violence. I mean, all of it is still there. It's not going to go away, but you have no line personnel to take care of it. So the blue flu is always, um, it's, it's, a, it's an implicit threat, right, with collective, uh, collective bargaining that, yeah, we can't strike, but we can all come down with the blue flu. So remember that when you're denying our options. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things that they do through collective bargaining is determine uh, the process of complaints and grievances. So I want to go through that. And a complaint is a statement of the problem versus a grievance, which is a formally registered complaint. The complaint, the complainant is the person making the complaint or the accusation. Um, who can be a complainant? The general public can, this could be a member of the public, somebody who's been arrested right? Um, employees of the law enforcement department, and that includes peers and managers. So complainants can come from any sort of direction. External complainants are what we call, are they going to be the ones that are made by citizens against an officer, a supervisor, or an entire department? And causes of those external complaints are typically things like use of excessive force, um, false arrest, improper entry, unlawful search, harassment, et cetera. Those, those are going to be what drive those complaints that come from the community to the organization. How do we reduce external complaints? Well, we talked about the importance of recruitment, right, and um, being able to pick the top, the best of the crop that comes in. So we want to be able to recruit and retain quality personnel. So that's part of it. Um, Training is another one, right? Uh, policy procedures and, and very clear statement of policy and manual or procedure and manuals so that officers know how, you know, what the boundaries are and so forth. Um, community outreach is another one. Um, always developing a good line of communication with the community um, means that these things are more likely to be handled informally rather than a formal complaint or external grievance. There's also something called internal complaints, and these can be made by officers or employees within the organization against a fellow member of the organization. And when that happens, it's typically taken, it's typically you know, to the next highest manager. Um, causes of internal complaints usually are safety conditions, right? That officers aren't being given safe working conditions, um, that the vehicles are not being maintained and updated, uh, that they're you're not being the officers aren't being given the tools they need to execute their jobs safely and efficiently. Um, lack of equipment needed to do the job, um, disability, discrimination, things of those types. How do internal complaints get solved or minimized? Um, you know, through communication, right? So we tend to categorize uh, internal complaints into two, one of two things, and there's a pinch, which is a minor problem, or there's a crunch, which is a major problem. If a pinch isn't taken care of, it will snowball and turn into a crunch. It will turn into that major problem. 
Um, the pinch model emphasizes the importance of communicating with the complainant um, and the negative consequences of those problems and, and re resolving those. Um, <clears throat> this sort of parallels the broken windows theory in that the idea is manage it well, it's a small problem because if we don't deal with the small issues, it will spiral out of control and become a big issue. Just like broken windows theory asserts, if we don't um, enforce the law against those quality of life crimes that are minor, if we don't, then, you know, people will push boundaries and it'll get bigger and out of control. Same thing with complaints and grievances. All complaints have to be investigated. There is no such thing as ignoring or dismissing a complaint. Um, and the following standards are adhered to. So first, the burden of proof is on the agency. Right? The, the agency has to prove, if they're going to discipline, that the officer behaved inappropriately. Um, the standard of proof is the preponderance of the evidence, which it's it's not reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is there's very little room for, um, you know, there's very little room for, for any question of whether or not someone did something, whereas the preponderance of the evidence is simply who has more proof. Whichever side has more evidence wins, right? Um, the standards of evidence are those of administrative law, not criminal law. So preponderance of the evidence is actually what we use in civil court and reasonable doubt is what we use in criminal court. So in this, in this instance, officers are being judged on the basis of the standards that we use in civil court. And no presumptions of truth are made regarding facts in the dispute or witness credibility. All people are deemed equally credible. And then conclusions are going to be logically deduced based off of the evidence. So who does this? This is typically going to be internal affairs, which I always say are the police who police the police. Um, officers investigated by internal affairs are guaranteed their constitutional rights, just like anybody else. Um, however, there is a caveat here that anything an officer has testified to in court that is on the public record uh, can be used against him or her in the administrative proceeding. So that is a little bit different because your general citizen is protected by constitutional rights, but they don't usually go on the record um, in, a, in, a law of, in a court of law. Um, often we refer to for mediations for dispute resolution. And a mediation is a form of alternative dispute resolution where there, a neutral third party comes in, known as a mediator, uh, and they're going to come in and they're going to facilitate communication from both sides. And they're going to try and negotiate between the parties to help them both meet um, a, a consensual agreement and outcome that they can all agree on about their dispute. Note that in a mediation, mediation is not legally binding to all parties involved. It is not. Okay. Um, a grievance, let's talk about grievance relative, you know, versus complaints. And a grievance is an action of the union on behalf of the complainant who feels that their complaint was inadequately resolved. So this can only come from the law enforcement. This cannot come externally from the community. And a grievance is going to be the person who files the grievance. Um, when there is a grievance, the, the response utilizes arbitration. And arbitration is a third party who listens to both sides and who is going to recommend a solution to all outcomes. And the distinction between arbitration versus mediation is that arbitration is legally binding. It doesn't matter if you don't like the outcome. Everybody is legally bound to it. So what are some possible outcomes of complaints and grievances? Well, there are a few categories. There, it can be sustained, right? And that means the accusation um, or the complainant or the grievance is supported. Um, it can be not sustained, which means the accusation has no support. It can be exonerated where the investigation deems the situation happened, but it was appropriate and legal. Nothing inappropriate happened. Yes, what is being accused of happened, but it didn't violate any rules, laws, policies, or procedures. And there is the final category, which is unfounded, where the complaint or grievance investigation determines that the accusation was unfounded or false.